part of it is reconnecting mind to body and to be aware of how my body reacts and to connect that with what I'm feeling and how to put words to it. Hi, my name is Gabriella Denry, MD, life coach at Doc Working, and welcome to Doc Working, the Whole Physician Podcast. I'm absolutely excited to bring my next guest today because I think we're going to have a really good conversation about one of the missing links to approaches to treatment of trauma. And this is very salient, very relevant for physicians who may be dealing with burnout. And one of the outcomes of burnout, as many of you know, is PTSD. And so I want to welcome to Doc Working, the Whole Physician Podcast, integrative psychotherapist, Francine Kelly. Francine, welcome. Thank you, Gabriella. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for being here because you are a specialist in what is called somatic experiencing or therapy based in somatic experiencing and other somatic modalities in helping people dealing with trauma. And you have, you know, facilitated workshops nationally and internationally to medical professionals relating to that, to these kind of integrative approaches to treatment of trauma. And so before we get into that detail, can you share with us exactly what inspired you to get into this kind of work? Wow. So that's a long story. And it's always so interesting where to start, right? Because I feel like so much of the work that we do is based on our history and what we needed in order to feel healthy, to feel well. I guess I'll start with, I was a yoga instructor. And yoga is something that I had the honor of being introduced to as a child growing up in Kingston, Jamaica, which you might recognize in the 19, was that the 1970s was a pretty odd sort of occurrence. But as a yoga teacher, I had learned how to track the whole body, right? To look at people and their whole experience. And so psychotherapy is actually my second career. I was a database manager for a decade. Yeah, and then I had two kids and all of a sudden I didn't want to do databases anymore. So I went back to graduate school to study counseling. And as I was doing my practice sessions as a student, as I was doing my internship at a domestic violence shelter, I realized that even as I was talking to people, which is what we were trained to do, there was something happening in their body. There were gestures that were happening. There was postures that were shifting. People were saying one thing, but their bodies were doing something else. That's a familiar thing, I'm sure, for physicians and for therapists. And so I thought, okay, something's going on here and I need to know how to do this. And I went looking. I thought I would have to figure it out myself. How do I integrate yoga? Because even doing a little bit of yoga with the women at the shelter, it was like, you know, I remember teaching a basic breathing technique and a little bit of stretching and their eyes got really big and they were like, oh my gosh, what is this? And so I wanted to know how do I do this? And so I started doing some research and I found out that there were trainings in yoga as an adjunctive to treating trauma, PTSD, and also that there were these somatic therapies that were available that already did the thing that I wanted to have happen. So I actually studied somatic experiencing and also sensory motor psychotherapy, which is another somatic psychotherapy method. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what is somatic? Uh Uh-huh. So somatic is basically of the body, right? So we recognize that there is an experience. Our emotions happen in our bodies. Yeah. I mean, how do you know you're happy, right? You smile. Your facial expression changes, that's physiological. There's an opening of your chest, right? If you're excited, you might get butterflies in your stomach. If you're scared, then your body might tighten, your jaw might tighten. Yeah, if you're angry, your eyes get really big. Our emotions are actually physiological experiences that we give names to, we call them emotions. In some cultures, There isn't a different word for a feeling versus a sensation. The word that denotes emotion includes the physiology that comes with the emotion. 
So what's the drawback of separating the two is there? I mean, we're in a place and in a time where there is this need to, and even in myself, as I'm continuing to heal the aftermath of PTSD, which I burnt out as a primary care physician, and I'm still realizing that after all these years of having stepped away from clinical medicine, that I'm still dealing with the after effects. Yeah. And part of it is reconnecting mind to body and to be aware of how my body reacts and to connect that with what I'm feeling and how to put words to it. Why is this important to make that connection? So that's a great question. What's the drawback of separating mind from body? Well, the first drawback is that we're not our whole selves, right? Because you're not a separate mind and body. When you leave your house, your whole system goes with you. And so when I talk about emotions happening in the body, our reactions to our life experience are happening, not just in our minds, but in our physiology as well. And if we're just trying to think our way out of activation, what we call activation, right? Anxiety, anger, stress, worry. If you're trying to think your way out of it, then it's actually, I want to say it's hard. Because emotions are very hard to corral, but your physiology, right? So I mentioned, okay, if I'm getting anxious, then my shoulders might creep up. Now, my brain is also tracking my physiology to see how are things going? So as my shoulders are creeping up, there's a part of my consciousness that's tracking that that's going, oh, something must be wrong, right? So now I really start to get anxious. The alternative to that is my shoulders start creeping up. I'm aware of that. I allow my shoulders to let go. And now there's a different experience that's happening overall. Yeah, and that's just a really simple example. Of course, it's more complex than that. But it means that we don't have to be victims of the experience that's happening in this part of our system. We can notice it, we can track it, we can do something about it. And when I settle what's happening here, then the message, right, to the tracking part of my brain is, oh, okay, things are all right. You know, we don't have to escalate here. Does that help? I think that helps. What I'm hearing you say is that noticing what your body is doing. I mean, our body will always react and tell me if this is wrong or right. Our bodies react before our brain even knows what's going on. Would that be a correct assessment? Yeah. I actually read about a study once. I'm trying to remember where I heard about this, but these people were on a safari and someone was sitting with a child in the back and sort of instantaneously went and rolled the window up. This is the story as I remember it. And soon after that, something came up into their view that was threatening. Right. So it's sort of like we're tracking all the time. Stephen Porges calls it neuroception. So we're always tracking our environment. We're tracking other people in our environment. Our systems are constantly checking to see what's going on out there in here. But we're not always aware that we're doing that. So we react right out of whatever it is that we're picking up subconsciously. We react if that was something threatening in the past, if it's novel, right? Because we react to novelty as well. And depending on how new things affected you in the past is whether you're going to be like, oh, cool, a new thing, or your system's going to go, something's wrong, something's wrong. I need to be vigilant. Also, you know, sometimes we're just living in vigilance. Let me stop you here because I think that that brings up a really, really good point. You talked about activation and let's go into what that means a little bit Mm -hmm. but you said that the brain doesn't make a difference between being activated from a past event or being activated from a memory of a past event or something that recalls that memory in the present the brain doesn't make the difference between past or present and so as you said we could be walking with that activation 24 7 or that sense of stress 24 7 So tell me about what is activation? Okay, very good question. When I work with clients, it helps for us to have a way of understanding, right? We'd like to know what's going on. I always say if we can understand what's happening in us, if we have words to describe what's happening and ways to shift that, then we're not victims of our own experience. So what is activation? 
we've all heard of fight or flight response, right? So that's part of it. The ways that we respond to something that strikes our systems as potentially unsafe, potentially threatening. We might go into fight, we might go into flight, but there's more to it than just that. We may also freeze. I can't fight, I can't flee. This threat feels so big that I have to just be really, really still, right? Because so many of our responses come from the olden days, if you will, when we were dealing with predators. We are animals, right? Our systems operate very much on a mammalian response. We are animals in the end, even though we have these wonderful cortices that help us to reason. And sometimes that actually gets in the way. Okay, so fight, flight, I might go into freeze. Yeah, all of that we call activation. What else could happen though, is I might decide that the best way to deal with this potential threat is to appease. And appeasement, it's a way that we try to make ourselves safe. Yeah, all of these responses get a bum rap, I always say, because they're all very natural ways of dealing with threat. And we should be able to deal with the threat. Once the threat is over, we get to settle again. That's the idea, one of the things in somatic experiencing that Peter Levine, you know, sort of elucidated was what we call a threat response cycle, where we recognize a threat, we orient to the threat, and we respond to it. And once we respond to it, all those neurotransmitters that came up, all the biochemicals that came up to help us to move into fight or flight or freeze, sometimes we fold, we might collapse, all of that biochemistry gets discharged either by us shaking or laughing, or sometimes it's just a, a small sort of reaction, but we discharge and then we're able to come back to that original state, right? Of exploratory orienting, we call it, where I feel like I'm okay, I can move through the world, you know, threats might come, but I can deal with them. And each time we face a threat, it's sort of like with a pathogen, yeah? When, when a pathogen attacks, your system kind of goes into creating antibodies to deal with that. And once you've fought it off, the next time the system knows what to do. It has built capacity for it. So we're designed similarly where we can build capacity for threat. But when we get interrupted in that threat response cycle, when something happens and we're not able to complete our defense, or we didn't see the threat coming, or it's just so much that we feel overwhelmed. You know, from a somatic lens, we really look at trauma as overwhelmed to the system. When we feel overwhelmed and we're not able to deal with it in the way that helps us to move through and to build our capacity, then in our view, that's when we end up with PTSD. Okay, so if I'm understanding correctly, it means that there's a point where we kind of blunt the response or the response to the natural response to how to deal with a traumatic event or experience or traumatic activation or trigger or memory, it doesn't go all the way to completion. And that's where we get into trouble, such as PTSD or other, I mean, would you say that things like depression, anxiety stays in the body for that reason as well, that the responses to trauma don't get resolved? Yeah, there's something that wanted to happen that didn't get to happen. I mean, at a sort of maybe least sort of threat, you know, at a lower level of threat, you wanted to say something to someone and you didn't get to say it, right? So there's this sort of buildup of defense that never gets to be expressed. So, so if it never you, gets to be expressed, it goes somewhere else. Where does it go? In the body. Yes, that's where it goes. That's somewhere else. It never goes anywhere. Right. And anger is one of those things, especially there's so many ways that we're also trained into, well, you're not supposed to feel that you're not supposed to be angry. God knows you can't be angry at a patient. Right. Of course, you can't do that in the space of the interaction. But when you leave, what happens then? Often what happens then is we beat ourselves up. I'm not supposed to feel this. Like all the messages that we have about how to be good people right? If we even notice that it has built up in our system, because oftentimes we just, we ignore it. 
there's so many ways in sensory motor psychotherapy, they talk about adaptive strategies, which are like the ways that we try to adapt. And these strategies, we usually learn them really early on, right? Like in our family system, this is how I'm going to adapt to, you know, and so, so many of these responses, again, are tied up in our adaptive strategies. If I had to freeze because I lived in an environment where there was intermittent explosivity, maybe from a parent, and I learned that the best way to be safe was just to be really still. So I didn't, you know, bring any attention to myself. Then that might end up being the strategy that I use when a patient is angry at me. Or when I don't know what to do, when I get that sense of activation comes. Yeah, so then we get to start to learn to recognize that in ourselves. That's part of what I love about this work is that because you're paying attention, what's actually happening in my physiology right now? Are my shoulders coming up to my ears, right? Did I just stop breathing? Am I collapsing? Is my whole body sort of going into collapse? And as we start to pay attention to that, what helps me, right, when that happens? Because oftentimes there isn't an actual threat. We might be perceiving a threat. And so like you said, right, so the body responds to a perceived threat that's based likely on something from the past. So can I come back to the present moment and what's so, actually happening here? Right, exactly. Stay tuned for more after this message from Empath IQ. Empath IQ gives individual physicians and medical practices a way to control the online review process. Let Empath IQ show you how to get more reviews, tie them to your personal Google My Business page, and respond to reviews with confidence. Visit empathiq.io, that's E M P A T H I Q. Dot io or call 858-375-5686. Mention you're a doc working fan and get two months free. So what would be, because I'm also trying to make kind of the differentiation between, as you said in the beginning, we can't think our way out of trauma, but there is some thought involved, I guess, as you're, <laughs> <laughs> you know, your shoulders are going up, you got, oh, my shoulders are going up. Which choice am I going to go? I'm going to escalate the situation, get anxious about it, or am I going to take a deep breath and relax? And even if the circumstances around me haven't changed, but my response to it changes. At the same time, when a person is activated, are there certain things that they can do right away to help alleviate some of the anxiety and the stress? Particularly if that feeling of overwhelm just is overwhelming and you can't see anything, hear anything, or understand anything. It's just panic city. What would you recommend? Yeah. So to answer your first question, you can't think your way out of it in the sense of there's a difference between thinking and observing. Yeah. And I love it in the yoga system. And I know we were going to talk about SE today, but I hope it's okay that I bring in yoga because it's all somatic, right? They figured that out thousands of years ago. But in the yoga system, we talk about the difference between automatic thoughts and the observing self. And so our automatic thoughts is just that like, my brain is running in reactivity. The observing self is this part of us that can pause, check in, ah, my shoulders are up to my ears right? And so there's, <laughs> I'm trying to talk about a lot of complexity. A simple thing then is, can I allow them to let go? And what happens in my experience now? Or I've stopped breathing, right? Can I notice that there's plenty of air? And can I notice the tension that comes as I stop breathing? And as I allow that tension to let go, what happens now? But a big part of this also has to do with if I'm in danger right now, I need to respond to that threat, yeah? But so many times we have these reactions and there isn't an actual threat. So that being in the present moment, you know, we talk about that with mindfulness and people are like, oh, okay, so I know I have to come back to the present moment. But you can't really check for threat if you're operating on the past, right? You can't really check for a threat that you're worried about is going to happen in the future. And that's what happens. 
Someone said we are multidimensional beings. So we literally operate, our brains operate in the past, the present, and the future. And usually we're either in the past or in the future. We humans so seldom are actually right here, right now. And that's one of the things that also I love about somatic work is that we do it here and now. It's not what did you feel when the trauma happened? It's what's happening in your system right now as you think of that. And we only go to that if the person's system has already had a capacity to continue to be in the present moment as we think about difficult things that happened in the past. What I'm hearing is someone has to be able to make room for that, have that capacity, because in the moment, it can't necessarily happen that this new information comes in. It's like, okay, well, what do I do? What strategy do I employ to bring myself out of this state of anxiety, let's say? So how would a person be able to, you know, break that cycle as quickly as possible? (laughs) Because we want to do it quick, right? Uh, Well, okay, let me... (laughs) You're right. You're right. There's the in the moment thing that is happening. Something is triggered right away or activated right away. And then there's how does a person develop these coping skills over time? So let, let me split that in two, therefore. Yeah. Okay. So I find what, you know, what we call psychoeducation to be really, really helpful of just like, here's how your nervous system works, right? My system goes, into sympathetic charge, like on a dime, or my system goes into shutting down on a dime, right? Just being able to understand that so we can start to name, oh, this is what's happening. Because like I said in the beginning, in my experience and in working with clients, when I have some way of just being able to go, ah, I understand what's happening in this experience. And another part of this is normalizing, right? This is how our systems are designed to work. So if I'm activated, it's not like I go, what's wrong with me? Why am I being activated? I get to go, okay, something must have felt threatening to me. Something must have felt like a threat. Let me start to get curious now, right? So curiosity. Curiosity is huge. Peter Levine says you can't be curious and traumatized at the same time. Like we get to sort of notice, ah, okay, something's going on right now. In my yoga training, one of the mantras that was given by Kriyananda Ji, who was the head of the yoga school where I did my training, he said, isn't that interesting? Right. But that's not uh, like I'm going to go into analysis and trying to figure this out. This is a observing self. This is me stepping back from, you know, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, and going, oh, okay, that's interesting. And then we get curious what's happening in the body, right? If something starts feeling, ah, then I get to go, okay, this feels like activation. How is this activation showing up? Because I could imagine that, you know, knowing how my brain functions and used to function, I had to know why. Why is this happening? Why am I getting there? Why am I feeling the way this is? I don't understand. why I shouldn't be feeling this way. So rather than asking why, it's to just say, hmm, that's interesting. To be that curious observer, no judgment, no, as one of my teachers used to say, no judgment, no heat, that we we don't, don't increase the temperature. It's just an observation, which means that I don't actually have to know why. At first, right? Because... When you're trying to figure out why from that place of activation, when you're trying to figure out why from that place, you just end up spinning. Like that's not a place that we can actually make any kind of reason, right? We know what happens in sympathetic charge. Our cognition is not firing on all cylinders when we're in high sympathetic charge. And also we're not relational in that place either right? So there's a challenge then of, okay, like, can I self-regulate, which is step one. I mean, eventually what we also want to be able to do is build our capacity. But I often talk to clients about we're building a toolkit for self-regulation, you know, back to the story I told about working at the shelter. There's a yoga teacher who says, it doesn't matter what you give someone, as long as you give them something. If I feel like I have some sense of being able to settle my own physiology in the moment, right? Then 
at least I'm not a victim, as I said before. And then at least I feel like, okay, there's something I can do here, right? A, I understand, yeah, this is sympathetic charge. I'm in fight or I'm in flight or I'm just like, my anxiety has kicked up. That means something must have happened that felt threatening or overwhelming. But before I address that, what can I do with this activation, right? Because again, as long as you're sure, like in this moment, there's no threat, right? If there's a tiger chasing you, that sympathetic charge is totally understandable. You need to address that, right? If someone is attacking you relationally or physiologically, then we want to be able to deal with that threat physical threats. Yeah, we want to be able to fight or flee. And one of the things that we do with somatic work is to bring those responses back online, because again, we have to have those responses online. So it's a question of having these responses as part of your natural physiology, because we are human, we are mammalian, that's what we do. If we need to run, we run. Yes. And we still have to be able to garner that immediately. And at the same time, knowing when You know, if a tiger is coming after me, I don't want to be sitting there thinking about, hmm, should I, shouldn't, (laughs) I wonder if I should run or curl up in a ball or just, (laughs) what should I do? I just go skedaddle, right? Right. At the same time, in our day-to-day lives, it's knowing that when we're activated, as you said, how to self-regulate, because sometimes that activation is not necessarily appropriate to the moment, right? but it's there. Right. And so, as you said, building that toolkit, which I love that phrase, to building a toolkit for self-regulation, and that's something that is learned over time. And with the help, of course, of the support of an SE-trained therapist or an integrative therapist who looks at mind and body in terms of healing trauma and healing wounds and how to deal with activation in the moment. Does that kind of sum it up a little bit? It does sum it up. But I wanted to throw out just one other little quick grounding technique, which is as I'm sitting, I can feel my seat under me. I can feel my feet on the floor. So if you even want to just play with that just for a second to just feel right, the support of the chair that you're sitting on the back of the chair. And is your body holding itself up, which is what we tend to do when we're vigilant, right? Or in this moment when there's safety, can your body allow itself to just be held by the chair? And then sometimes it's also a matter of when what's going on in the body is too much. Can I focus on something outside of myself that's a little more resourcing or settling? Something pleasant, looking at the sky, looking at the face of a loved one, feeling that connection with someone who will hold you relationally. Yeah, not necessarily physically, although that's really good too, because we regulate through touch. But being with someone who has the ability to be calm and settled, also co-regulation, right, will settle ourselves. And I think physicians especially have a challenge because you're going in and out quickly and dealing with people whose nervous systems are already revved up because of whatever they're dealing with physiologically. And we pick that up, right? When you're with someone who's got that charge, you might start to feel that even though it's not yours, even though it has nothing to do with you right? Because we are relational beings and we vibe off each other, right? Highly medical terms. We vibe off of each other. So if I move into a space with someone whose nervous system is activated, then I'll start to feel that. But if I am not in touch with my own body, I'll think that I'm activated too. And not recognizing that I'm just picking up what's in the field. And so another reason to really be able to pay attention to our own selves is we get to go, is this mine or am I picking this up in the room? And that way my brain doesn't start going, oh, I must be really anxious. It's like, no, that's not my anxiety. I'm just resonating with what's happening with this other person, right? And then when I walk out of that room, before I go to see my next patient, I can allow myself to regulate. I can let go of the tension or whatever it might be that I started to feel, right? Because my system was resonating with the other person in the room because I don't own it. And it does take time. I mean, I've heard that before from other practitioners as well. Is it yours? And it takes a little while to understand the difference between the two because it does feel like it's mine. I don't even realize I'm picking up somebody else's energy. 
but if I was feeling fine five minutes ago and now I'm feeling anxious and I have no idea why. Something and changed. Exactly. Something did change. And so that's another benefit of being present with the body because that's where that's happening. If you try to think your way through, is that mine? What, what, what are you asking? Is that yours? Right. But if you start to feel tension, if you start to feel tightening, sometimes you can even feel your body doing it. And you look at the other person, you're like, oh, OK, you can see it in them. Right. That's the thing. The body gives you a concrete place to work with what's happening in your emotional state. So you find that working with physicians, that part of the challenge, perhaps, and I don't want to generalize, is to go below the neck. In other words, <laughs> to connect mind and body so that the body becomes your friend. It becomes your gauge as to what is going on out there, because that's our primordial system is what happens in the body. But do you find that in working with healthcare workers, do you find that that's been a challenge? in getting that connection going? Or is that just a, a general thing of living in the Western world? Yeah. You know, I mean, if you think about it, we get good at what we practice, right? How many years, a decade sometimes, do physicians spend practicing being up here? But it's what our society sort of as a whole tends to value right? It's like, if I can just power through, or if I can just figure it out, then everything's going to be okay. And some of this stuff is not figure outable, because it's not logical. It's logical in the one sense, and it's not in another. And that's where I feel like psychoeducation is so helpful. If you understand, right, the smell of this woman's perfume reminds me of a teacher who yelled at me in elementary school. Like if you understand that triggers in the environment could have to do with something that's not in the present moment, right? Even if you don't necessarily know what the trigger is, there's a way that you get to go, oh, okay, something happened. I don't know exactly what it was, but something happened. So back to the question of we tend to live in our heads. At this point in my career, people come to me because they want to do somatic work. So they've already figured out that something's going on in the body. But even then, it can be hard. So like people go, well, you're telling me to check in with my body, but I don't know what that means. So what does that mean? We're checking, did something change in your facial expression? Is there some shift in your muscle tension or relaxation? Did your sense of presence kind of shift? Do you feel like you're all here or not quite here? Are there emotions that showed up, right? Because like I said, emotions happen in here. And sometimes we can find those before we can notice body. We can notice emotion. And then like, are there sensations? Are there inner body sensations? Is there a movement that's trying to happen in your system? Those are some of the things that we can track to help us to notice body. And for folks that have a hard time with that, sometimes just because you're busy all day long, right? And this is not something that's part of your routine. So sometimes I'll encourage clients that I work with to just set a little reminder on your phone for once an hour or put a little post-it on your screen that says pause. And the pause, right, we get good at what we practice. So all of these things are habitual responses. The pause can become a habit. So if you pause once an hour and just notice, how am I doing right now? How's my body? Am I breathing? <laughs> what was the last time I took a breath? Or like, yeah, do I feel like I'm here or am I operating at 50 miles an hour? Can I sit back, feel my back against the chair, feel my seat on the seat of my chair, feel my feet on the floor? Huh, can I just allow myself 15 seconds to take an out breath? Just notice five exhales. Instead of your system revving, 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 revving all day, instead you go up, you come down for 15 seconds, right? You go up the next hour, you come down. And so we start to cultivate this habit in the body of settling is okay for a little bit, just 15 seconds, just five breaths, just a pause to notice, right? Can I feel myself? And then that starts to become a little more of a habit. What I used to do when we were in person is as I would leave one client, I would just imagine 
that anything that I might have picked up, any activation in my system, that on the exhale, I was just allowing it to release down and out through my feet. Imagery, right? Sometimes that works for some people. If you just keep doing that, just every now and then, allow yourself to check in. I would ask the question, is there anything in my body right now or mind that's available to just let go? Can I allow myself to let go or somewhere in my body, in my mind, to just let it go and allow myself to be supported? I think when the imagery for me of the chair is being able to sit in the chair, feel my arms on the armrest, my feet on the floor, my shoulders come down. Did I take a breath? Let me take a breath and just allow myself to, as you said, feel the chair. For me, it's also another way of saying, do I allow myself to feel supported? I love that imagery and I love that thought. Francine, to wrap things up, I mean, you talked about so much. And my question to you is how would a clinician, a physician who is now at a point where they realize that whatever method they were using before to try and deal with stress and trauma and releasing stress and trauma, they may have worked, but perhaps were somewhat limited that they're ready to get to the next stage, really looking at somatic responses and how to build that somatic toolkit. Where would a physician find that resource? So traumahealing.com is the website that has a list of practitioners all over the world. So that's one place that they could go. As I said, there's multiple different systems and different things work for different people. Yeah. So for some people, a yoga class with a teacher that specializes in trauma sensitivity so that they understand how to work with the nervous system through the yoga process. I think would also be great. And some people are like, I don't want to go to therapy. And I get that. And also the type of therapy that we do, we're not sitting and talking about the past. We're really working with skills to help you to deal with what's happening in the present. So traumahealing.org, I mentioned sensory motor psychotherapy is another system that I've been trained in and they have a website as well, sensorymotorpsychotherapy.com. I mean, if you don't mind sharing about that, you have a group, which I actually, I said, pick me, pick me. (laughs) So I'm signing up to do just that, to develop that kind of toolkit. Yeah. So my colleague, Anita Mandley, and I developed what we call the Integrative Trauma Recovery Group. It's a 24-week group process that combines skills and frameworks, understandings from yoga, SE, and DBT because I was also trained in dialectical behavioral therapy. What is dialectical behavioral (laughs) therapy? In a quick nutshell. DBT is developed by Marsha Linehan. It's typically recommended for working with people that have been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, which ultimately, you know, is a complex trauma presentation. And the group, it's a psychoeducational group that also includes mindfulness-based interventions. It's another skill building group. You know, I taught DBT groups for years, and there's a lot of value in DBT. And they've just more recently started to include the body. But Anita and I are both, we're SCPs. You know, she was my trainer for DBT. And so we put these skills together in really, we call a titrated way. So little bit at a time to build, because with trauma, if we try to throw too much at the nervous system at once, it's too much, right? And if you come in and you haven't worked with the body, for me to be like, okay, so let's sit and just notice how that terrible thing that happened to you is showing up in your physiology right now, it creates more overwhelm. So the group steps us gently through with psychoeducation. You know, Anita and I were thinking about how do we provide this information because we can only see so many clients in a week. So the group was a way to bring the topics that we use with individual clients into a group format so that we can provide information and skills and experiential practices for people who are recovering from trauma that they can build their toolkit. How can people sign up for that or get in touch with you or Anita? Oh my goodness. I know, I know. (laughs) You may have an onslaught, but... (laughs) So Don't forget, web- I'm the top of the list. <laughs> <laughs> my website is francinekelly.com. I have a contact page on the website. 
Um, the groups are typically smaller. You know, one of the things that we're interested in doing is training other clinicians to be able to run the ITR groups. So someone's interested in learning how to do that, then they can contact me as well. Yeah. What I love about this is a total like integrated approach that brings in the whole human being, body and mind to really work together as opposed to one going in one direction, the other one going in the other direction. We're trying to bring them together. And for people to have that toolkit, as you said, that ability to put into practice in their own lives on a day-to-day -day basis, as they get a little better, they build that muscle gradually over time. As you say, to titrate up somebody's ability to deal with activation or traumatic experiences or the aftermath, rather, of traumatic experiences, whether they'd be present or in the past. Francine Kelly... You are fabulous, and you. I hope that we can bring you back at some point to further this conversation. This was fascinating. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me, Gabriella. It's lovely. Such an honor. Hello, and thank you for listening. This is Amanda Taran. I'm the producer of the Doc Working Podcast. If you enjoyed our podcast, please like and subscribe. We would also love it if you checked out our website, which is docworking.com. And you can also find us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and on Instagram. On Instagram, we are docworking1, and that is with the number 1. When you check us out on social, please let us know what you would like to hear on the podcast. Your feedback really means a lot to us. And if you're a physician with a story you'd like to tell, please reach out to me at amanda at docworking.com to apply to be on the podcast. Thank you again, and we look forward to talking with you on the next episode of Doc Working, the Whole Physician Podcast.